Good morning and welcome to IBN Spotlight this week. I'm Shanta Misra. An Indian photographer, Raghubir Singh, regarded by critics internationally as one of the finest photographers working today, has captured indelible images of various cities in India and produced 10 successful books, ranging from Kashmir to Kerala. He is here with us in our studio in New York in the wake of the release of his latest book on the city of Bombay. Namaskar Raghubir and welcome to our studios. Tell us, in the process of chronicling the essence of life in India, which is a vibrant and uh, divergent society, you seem to have captured more than a moment in time. I see a sense of timelessness in some of your pieces. How did you achieve that? Well, through a lot of hard work. You have to um, keep on doing it and it slowly things happen and things come to you. Photography has a history of experimentation uh, with all modernist and avant-garde styles, but is still identified as depicting reality. And yet there are constructed photography through darkroom manipulation and there is computer imaging. What are your impressions on this? Well, I'm, I'm rooted in the documentary style, so I, I, um, I'm not uh, the other experimentation or whatever you call it, the computer image, that doesn't interest me because all that takes the photography very, very close uh, to other mediums, mm -hmm. while f documentary photography is a medium by itself. It stands like a rock, you see, and I think that's, that's my belief and I think the the main thrust will photography will not change from documentary, I think. So that is this thing about depicting reality? Well, it's, let's say it's real and unreal. It's, it's fiction and non-fiction. It's documentary it's and fiction at the same time. Blended together. Blended together through, through, through a sense of illusion. It's, it's, it's reality and illusion at the same time. So is your work largely intuitive and not planned to create yeah. a desired effect? It has to be intuitive. It has to be intuitive, but there is an element of programming which comes to you, like you play tennis, you go on court, you know, you prepare for the game, but once you're there, then it's, it's purely intuitive. There so is no time that. to think, you just click right. as you see something. Exactly. Your experience and your formulation and your, uh, your preparation then helps, uh, informs your, uh, your intuition. Oh, sure. In your latest book on Bombay, uh, you have captured the sheer energy and vibrancy of a city that is a blend of the ancient and uh, the contemporary, the East and the West, with a sort of a frankness. Uh, was there a motivation in bringing forth this quality? I think uh, the, the place itself uh, demands, you know, it, it sort of uh, provokes something and the place uh, uh, like in the introduction to this to this book uh, on Bombay, Naipaul says the setting uh, makes the people and the people make the setting. So it's like you see the place uh, provoked something in me, and I was responding to something. To something that was. And there. there's a larger experience of the visual arts and other things that you bring to it. You see, so it's a oh, sort definitely. of your own personal growth at the same time uh, re reflected in it. So how long did it take before you really felt? the vibrations of the city that you were working in? Well, I first went to Bombay in 1964, very early in my career. And I've been going from time to time, but I was interested more in Calcutta before Bombay. And you have done a book on I've Calcutta. I've done two books on Calcutta. Mm -hmm. And I've done a book on Banaras. So all that experience uh, Adds uh, fell, to this. Add, uh, came uh, to my help. And once I got interested in Bombay in about 1988-89 and thought now I should really uh, do something here, um, it, it required a lot of work but uh, I think finally things started falling together. Has the fact that you now live in the West uh, given you a different perspective of your homeland and therefore or thereby influenced your work? Well, I, I, I think that has been an important factor in my life and it, in fact it might have saved me because um, the, the element of distance, the element of looking at something with a, with a distance but yet being, uh, spending the amount of time that I have done in India, being involvement at the same time, 
involvement and distance simultaneously. And I think what I was saved off also was from the, the nationalism of India, which has a negative role in the Indian visual arts. I think it has had a negative role, the hold of the bureaucrat. If I had lived in Delhi, I would have been uh, perhaps caught up, in that. caught up in that. And I think that has saved me. Do you think that in that case, photography as a craft is hampered by this factor greatly? I think all the visual arts have been hampered. I think the hold of the bureaucrat, the license Raj, uh, has affected all, uh, all the arts, the visual arts. I think these, uh, in time they will go. I think the present government is not really interested in, 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 the, in having a hold on the arts as much as the past mm -hmm. governments. Have. Who are the people who have affected your work in a profound way? Well, Satyajit Ray, I think, uh, you know, when he makes statements like um, that there is something very exciting about uh, creating art or making a film with the barest of means, because we have the essentials to get to the human essence. I think some remark like that is extraordinary. And, and the photographer Cartier-Bresson, who brought the first uh, in photography, the moralistic eye, the uh, kind of a moral sense to India was brought first by Cartier-Bresson. And I think Indian photography didn't have anything like that before. From your huge body of work, you must have some favorite photographs. Would you share with us some of your feelings on them? This, for instance, this picture is a very simple picture of a child. Child with and her with, with, her with maid. a maid. And this is taken in a friend's house. Be there is behind this book a great element of autobiography in the sense I photographed it around my friends. Yes. And my friends have taken me to their places, so it's this, uh, there's an element of autobiography in it which is not immediately uh, apparent. It is and it isn't. Yes. Because I, you, you merge it with the city. Is there an element of surprise when you first look at your photographs like a potter opening the kiln? Yes, yes, because you see, you don't know whether it's going to work or whether you have fa when, when you when you look at the picture, uh, when it's back from the lab, it's been processed. I, I shoot slides, you know, chorochrome slides. So you lay them on the ground glass and you look at them. There is, it's, it's the, it's, it is the moment of truth. There is a moment of truth out in the field when you're taking When you're the, working. When you're working, the moment of truth. Uh, but the, in a sense, the real moment of truth is when you edit your picture. When you see the that product. That is why the photographer must edit his her or her own pictures. And that is a very important process. As, as important as taking the pictures. Probably in a, in a, you could even argue that it's more important than taking the pictures. So you learn a lot from your mistakes and... Exactly. Without mistakes... So that is the growth, basically. Well, photography itself has emerged out of mistakes. Art itself would not exist without mistakes. Oh, sure. I know people are very wary about giving advice, but if you're boxed into a corner and asked to give advice to some struggling photographers, what would you say to them? Well, for, for someone in India, I would say that you have to learn, um, uh, you have to be, have a thorough grasp of the history of photography and of the visual arts. I think you must familiarize yourself with the visual arts and then... In a holistic sense? Yeah, in a large sense, and then particularly the history of photography, and um, which is actually the history of photography in the West. There is no other history of photography. There is no other history. So, so you have to relate to that. And then take it from there, tie it with your own experience of life, and who you are and where you belong. Raghubir, you seem to have established a long-term relationship with an American foundation. This must be of great advantage to you. I think so. It's because you see, it's it's a it's a very difficult profession. You can't do books and all. And Aperture is bringing out books, and they have a gallery. And Michael Hoffman is advisor to the Philadelphia Museum of Art. And I think it is it is something qu quite important for me that they have taken an interest in my work and they are promoting my work. And, and this is not normal, is it? For uh, you are the first Indian well, photographer. Well, for Americans, to they have, have Robert Adams. Aperture has a long uh, connection, old connection with Robert Adams. But f to do it with someone from India is exceptional, I think. You're I, the first. I, yeah, I'm the first. Well, or someone from Asia. Like, let us say someone from Asia. I don't think there's any other person from Asia or any other part of the world, or even Europe. There, there isn't that much. Uh, people go from book to book. But to have this program, so I... I On a long-term basis. I'm delighted that Aperture have uh, taken this kind of interest in me. 
Raghubir, you have been enormously successful in all your work and we at IBN want to congratulate you on that. Thank you so much for being with us. We want to wish you all the best and continued success for all your work. Namaskar. Namaskar. Thank you. That was Raghubir Singh, an internationally acclaimed Indian photographer. If you want to catch his latest books on Ganges and Bombay, they are available at the Aperture Gallery and Bookshop, telephone 212-505-5555, extension 300. Till we meet again on IBM Spotlight, I'm Shanta Misra. Have a great week.